Good morning and a very warm welcome to week number three of this Python level one course. Um, if this is your first time joining us, my name is Paul and this is a Python level one course in which we are getting a good solid foundation of Python. Um, in last week's class, we looked at the beginning of writing Python in which we looked at types, we looked at variables, we looked at the input-output functions, and we also looked at um, operations. We looked at basic operations, and we looked at um, the logical operations, and we saw how those work. If you are following along with the class, then you've probably gone through the exercises. The exercises are a very helpful way for you to have a nice, solid understanding of how the, how the various parts of Python work. So in this class, we are talking about um, lists, tuples, and exceptions. And we're going to go through that step by step. Um, but the order of today's class, I'm going to begin by just going through some of the material from last week, um, some ideas which I thought um, some of the students might have struggled with. So, um, so let's get started with week three of seven lists, tuples, and exceptions. Now, in this class, as I've said, I'm going to be looking at three things, lists, tuples, and exceptions. We'll spend a lot of time on lists because lists are very rich and there's a lot of things you can do with lists. Um, and then eventually we are going to take a diversion and look at tuples very briefly just to see what are the differences between lists and, and, and tuples. And then we're going to end the class with, by looking at exceptions. And our objective there is to see how to, how to work with exceptions, how to handle exceptions, and how to raise our own exceptions. There are a bunch of keywords that we need to learn and we're going to look at all of that today. So, now from last week, there were a number of things that I thought um, many of the people in the class struggled with. Now, I haven't gone through all everyone's work just to understand um, if, if everyone had a problem with this, but it was very clear to me that this is, might be something that not everyone is familiar with. Now, Complex numbers, the way complex numbers work. I'll show you an example on the next slide. In Python, we now have the complex function, uh, which is for complex objects. It creates complex objects. And what you do is you provide it two arguments, the real part and the imaginary part. Um, I don't want to provide the solution because I still want to give you a chance to try a hand at, at that. Just because the assignment is completed doesn't mean you can't go back and try it out. For the tutored students, I'm going to give you detailed feedback. Um, if you want, we can schedule a time when we can um, we can meet and I can take you through the steps. Just let me know. Get in touch with me through the class. Um, and the, perhaps the most important thing for all the quizzes, not just for last week, even for this week and for the future quizzes, is use the Python console. The Python console is like your shortcut to finding the answers. So there's very little reason why you should uh, you should not get 100% because you have the Python console, you can try out each of the options, uh, you can try out various options, you can look at the documentation and try options, and, and you can figure out the answers before you actually try the, the quiz. So my, my, my encouragement to you is try and get 100% on the quiz because you have access to the Python console. If you are not familiar with the Python school console, just look at last week's video in which I showed step by step how to use the Python console, what you could do with it, how it's a playground and how you can, you can do various things with it. So let's just look at complex numbers. And so the co core idea behind co complex numbers is, is shown here on this slide. Typically, when you have a negative number inside a radical. So that's called a radical sign. So this sign of the square root is called a radical. Anytime you have a negative, you know you're going to have, end up with a complex solution. And the base of all complex solutions is the minus 1. So the radical of minus 1 is j. Now if you're looking at this from, from a mathematical point of view, you typically use i. 
But if you are doing it in engineering, and I don't know if they do it in, in, in physics, they'll use J because you want to distinguish it between alternating current I, small i. And for you to work out the solution for any negative number, you could decompose it as, as shown there. So in this case, you have the square root of minus 4 is the same as the square root of minus 1 times minus 4, which is the same as the product of the square roots of minus 1 and the product of the square root of minus 4. So this is, you can actually separate um, the radicals, and, and which is equals to the square root of 4 is plus minus 2, and square root of minus 1 is j. So you end up with plus minus j. So using this idea, if you have a the discriminant is negative, then what you need to do is convert the discriminant to negative and then pass these values. So pass the values to the complex function. So you have to split it at the divide sign. And if you need help with this, just let me know. But this is the core idea to solve that particular problem. Okay, so let's turn to material for this class and let's begin with list objects. Now in Python, we last week we looked at what would typically be called atoms with exceptional strings. Well, strings, you could treat them as, as atoms because they have a certain property called immutability. And when we look at that today with tuples, but integers, floating points, booleans, they usually have a single value. So you'd have, if you have a variable that has an integer value, then that variable can only have a single value. That variable can change values, but at any one time, it can only have one value. That's what we mean when we say atomic. It means it can't be broken up into, it, 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 doesn't, it can't be broken up into smaller parts, just in the same way we use the word atom in physics. With lists, we are doing something different. With lists, we are now having a container of multiple items. And that brings new opportunities in how we are going to treat data. So that means you can handle collections of related and possibly unrelated items. And you can experiment with that. But that's the key idea. Lists are containers. And they are an essential part of being able to write useful programs because you would end up representing natural phenomena which usually come as containers of things. So for example, a file can be treated, of, uh, uh, can be treated as a container of lines where each line in the file will be an independent stream. In the same way, you could treat things like matrices or you could treat things like um, uh, images as containers of different data items. Now, in this case, we're going to be looking at very simple lists where we there will just be numbers, or there will be booleans, or they will be there will be anything. But we'll begin with very simple examples. Now, for us to work with lists, we have to know a number of things. We need to know how to create a list. We then need to know how to perform some operations on lists and understand which methods are available on lists. And then the next thing we need to do is we need to be able to access the members of a list, and that's called indexing. And in Python, we have a special function called range, which allows us to generate special things called generators, which can eventually be treated, be converted into lists. And that's what you would do if you want to work with a range operator. But other times you'd want to use the range of operator if you want to do iteration. But we'll look at that in a future class. Uh, I think that's going to be either week five or week six, where we look at the four and the y loops. But for, for today, we're going to start with the list object, and we're going to start on how to create lists. So let's get started on doing this. Now I have my uh, Py, Py, PyCharm open here. Um, as part of the course material, you're going to see this available in the, as one of the links. And this has got everything you need. So I'm going to, at the end of each of these sessions, I'm going to create a, 
I just commit this and push this to GitHub and you can pull it and play around with it. So this is my module called lists. Now I understand from a number of you that the size of the content of the screen is too small and it's not clear to me how you're accessing this, whether you're using a mobile phone or, or you know, whether, whether the bandwidth is low and therefore the resolution is poor. So at the end of this class, we're going to have, I'm going to provide a link which you can give me feedback so that I can understand how you're using this material. But let's get started with lists. We're going to take a long time working with lists today. Now, there are several ways in which you can create lists. And I like using list. So there's a function or there's a class called list with um, where we can say L is equals to a list. And we can check what L is. So we can print L and we can check the type of L. So if we run this now, we're going to see how. So that shows what you see there is a square of empty brackets. So it's a bracket and not parentheses. We typically use the, the whenever, most of the time we we'll, we'll say that when we have the curved ones, we call them brackets, but that's not correct. They are called parentheses, but these are brackets or what people would say square brackets. And we can see that this is a class list. So that's an object of class list. In this case, this is an empty list and we can tell it's an empty list. We can print its length. So we have a next string here, the length of the list is, and we can say len of L. So if we run that again, it says the length of the list is zero. So there we have a list of length zero. That's one way you could create a list. Another way that Python provides that you can create a list is just by using a pair of empty brackets. So if I have another L, so L1 is equals to with brackets, and now I can put some values inside. So I can put five, six, seven, eight, and now I can print the length of L1 is len L1. And I can even print the L1 itself there. And now we can see the length of L1 is that. So those are the two main ways you could create a list. There are other ways you could create a list in which you could apply the list class and you can apply it on other containers to convert them from what they are into lists. But we're going to look at that later on and some of the exercises in the quiz will show you how to do that. So there we have a list. We have two lists, L and L1. Now, lists have various um, methods and I'm going to show you a special function in Python called dir. So let me let's open that. So if we come to the standard library, we look at the built-in functions, there is a function called dir. Let's click at that and look at that. So dir object without any arguments, list the names in the current scope, that's not what we are interested in. We are interested in the use of dir whenever we pass it an object. So if you provide an argument, it will attempt to return a list of the valid attributes for that object. But not just the attributes, to also provide for you the names of, by attributes it also means by the names of the methods. And that's useful if you want to see what's available on a, an object. So let's print the dar of L1. And if we run that, that's what it gives us. I'm gonna make this wrap so that you can see what's here. Now, that's a very important function and you'll find this, you'll find you, that you use it a lot of the time and you might even use it, end up using it on your own classes. But that shows you all the methods. Now, we're gonna look at some of these special ones when we look at the, in the next Python, uh, the Python level two course where we look at classes. So we're gonna ignore everything here which starts with a double underscore. We're just gonna focus on everything that's, um, that doesn't start with an underscore. So you see here, append, clear, copy, count, extend, index, insert, pop, remove, reverse, and sort. Those 
are methods that apply to the list object. The methods are ways in which we can do things with, with lists. So for example, we could, we can, I've listed a number of them there, and we'll get to them in a bit. But I just wanted you to see the DIR, I just write a note here, so DIR uh, show the attributes on object. So in this case, our object is a list. Now, anytime you have a list, because a list is a container, there are additional methods, additional operations that you could use on lists. And two of the important operations are the membership operations. You can check to find if a value is a member of the list. Now, we use the in keyword for this and we can check if a value is in a list. So let's check if the value six is in our list L1. And if we run that, it says it's true. Now notice in provides, a, a, when you use in, it returns, what it returns is a, is a Boolean. So that's, that membership check is a Boolean operation. And we'll see how to use that with if statements. You can also do the opposite of in, and that is not in. So this would be an application of, so inverting the in. So you could say print, um, um, let's say eight, not eight, let's say 12, not in L1. Now we know that 12 is not in, and we expect that it to be returned true, which is what it does, which is actually equivalent to saying that not 12 in L1. So those both return the exact same thing. Now don't be confused by, by um, what's happening there. In this case, the second case, line 17, we are inverting the check that 12 is in. 12 is not in, that returns false, and then we are negating not in. And in the second one, we are uh, asserting, we are making a positive check that 12 is not in. And that returns true. Now they return the same value, but they're doing it slightly different, in slightly different ways. So that's how we check membership of, of of a list, whether a certain item is a mem is a member of a list. Another thing that you could do with lists is you could do the plus operator. Now remember from last week when we looked at strings, we said the plus operator, while it can be used for numbers, it is not restricted to numbers, and we use show an example of that with a string. Now today we're going to look at one, an example in which we're going to use the plus operator on lists. So suppose we have a list and A is some list, which we have an empty list. And we say A plus another list. Um, we, 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 we will, re let's say we want to create a new list. So B is equals to A plus, and we'll create a list here, let's say seven, eight, nine. Um, and then we print the value of A. So we have an F string, A is equals to A. And we have B is equals to B. And that will show us, so A was an empty list and the, the plus operator extended the second list by, by taking what was in the first list and taking the second list and creating a new list. These are different lists. A and B are different lists. Now, to check if they are different lists, we use the ID operator. The ID operator is used, the ID function or the ID keyword is used to check um, identity, which is typically the memory address of, a, of an object. So if you print the ID of A, and if you print the ID of B, you end up with some big numbers. Those, those are the memory addresses. Let's just look at that from the documentation. ID. So that's another important function to keep it. So it returns the identity of an object. It's an integer which is guaranteed to be unique and constant for this object. Um, if, if you are running, so the default Python that you'd install by going to python.org, that's called CPython. That's another name of that Python. There are other kinds of Python which we don't need to know right now. 
And in, in C Python, this is the address in memory of the object in memory. Now, one of the things that beginners with Python would usually, one of the mistakes they will make, and it's important for me to point this out, is that whenever you create a list, so let's say we create a list called U, and this list has got some numbers, 12, 13, 14, 15, and we can print U. Let's do it with an F string, U is equals to U. And if we run that, we'll see that that is that list there. And then another one thing that would typically, the, the new programmer would do would be say V is equals to U. And then we print F V is equals to V. Okay. So what do we expect? We expect them to be the same because we have assigned that. And now this is where we get in trouble is if we make a change to v, so for example, if we add a new value to v, so this is, we're going to say v is, you remember we looked at this operator last week, v plus equals, and we put some new values, let's say 97, 98, and now we print u and v, so we print u is equals to u, and v is equals to v. So we get something strange here. Notice that we have changed u without making it explicit. We only changed v. For us to figure out what has happened here, we can print out the id of, of u and v. So the id of u is equals to id on u, and we do the same for v. And if you run that, it turns out that they have exactly the same memory um, location or the same ID, which means anytime you use the assignment operator with, a, with lists, you are just creating a new name to the same list, but you're not creating a new list. If you want to create a new list, then you have to use one of the um, methods called copy. And um, so what you should do is instead of doing this here, v is equals to, you should say u dot copy. And if you run that again, now we see that they're different. So that's an, a very easy gotcha that gets a lot of um, new people who are new to Python in trouble. So we've looked at the plus operator. We've seen how using the plus operator, there's a little gotcha there. So we have to do copy. Let me just write a note here. So use copy to make a copy and don't use assignment. Make a copy, don't use assignment. Otherwise you get into a lot of trouble. Um, there are other ways to do that, but this works for now. This is important, this is, yeah, this is sufficient for, for you to, to um, get going. We've looked at the length. Now let's look at the, the um, min and max operators or functions. So suppose we have a, so we've looked at, so we have u as a list. We can call max or min on, on, on the list. So in this case we have v, we can print the minimum value, min, min value, and we can say the min of v, we can do the same with max. We run that, we get the minimum value is 12, the maximum value is 98. So far we have looked at, we have looked at some of these basic ideas. Now let's look at indexing with lists. So remember a list is a container, it has multiple items inside it. Oh, let me just change this, so this is a maximum. When it comes to accessing the members of a, a, a list, we use indexing. And one of the things that you'll find strange in whenever you start programming, this is your first time, is that counting begins at zero. 
So our list here, V, when we printed it out, let's print it out again. So F, we print V is equals to V. So we have five items in that list. And the indexes by which we refer to them will start counting from zero. So this will be the zeroth item, the first item, the second item, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. And we can, therefore we can access the first item using, we could say print um, the first item is, and we could say V0. So that's how we access the first item is 12. So that's at position zero. And we could get the second item is, now we use one. Okay, so it's 13, and so on and so forth up to the end. Sometimes you want to access the last item, and if you want to access the last item, you, you could start counting using negative numbers. Now, to count negative numbers, we're going to count negative 1 will be the last item, negative 2 will be the second last item, so we don't, we'll not use 0 from the, the other side. Zero is the first item, and the moment you give it a negative, it's going to go to the back of the list. So the last item is V minus one. That's 98. And then we could look at the second last item, um, 97, okay? So that's, we're now accessing it from behind. So that's if we have the, the index, we know the position, but sometimes we don't know the position and we want to find, and we know the value. How do we do that? Well, that's where the index, dot index method comes from. Remember, we, we'll find out all the methods, we could find out all the methods using the dir um, function. Alternatively, we could just look at the documentation. So if you look at the documentation, let's just look at the documentation here, you'll have all these notes in your, they'll be available in the class. So we have a list and we've looked at the in, not in, plus. Uh, I'm gonna show you the multiplication on lists. We've looked at indexes and soon we're going to, shortly we're gonna be looking at slicing. We've looked at the length, the mean, the max, and now we're looking at the index. So let's look at the index and what you can do with that. So in our case, V has got a bunch of values, but we don't know the index of the value 12. So let's say we want to find out the, so print uh, 12 is at, and we'll use v.index 12. If we run that, it will tell us 12 is at index zero. Now it's going to give you the values in using starting from zero. What if you give it an index which is negative beyond the beginning? So let's try that and see what happens. So if you say, uh, let's come back here and we say, we know that the list has five items. We start minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, minus five, minus six. What if you say minus seven? Um, this is about one. The minus seventh item, so we're going from the back. Minus seven. We run that, we now get an index error. We would get the same index error if we tried to access from the beginning but beyond this, this the length of the list. So, so let's try that here. So the seventh, so we said let's say the sixth item. So remember there are five items in this list, zero, one, two, three, four, four is a maximum. If we say five, the fifth item, and we put an index of five, V5, let me just hide this for now. Um, are they five or they're six? Oh, they're six, so we should be saying the sixth. Uh, six. We, run that. we also get another index. Uh, is not? Okay, so it does throw an index, it does throw an index error. An index error occurs anytime you try to access a member of the list or you use an index which is not, which is outside this, the length of the list. And 
we, this is a special error which specifically refers to that. We'll see how to handle that with exceptions. But it's important to know what kind of exceptions are raised whenever you're working with lists. Okay, so there we have, um, we've looked at the index operator. Let's just go step one, step back, and we look at the multiplication operator on a list. Now, it's a handy way if you want to, so I'll come back right here to the top. Um, let's, let's write the multiplication operator, so on list. Suppose you have a list. Um, B is my list. Um, and I want to make it out of, let's say, the number 3. But I want to have 20 values of 3. Then I could multiply that together, and I could print B. So whenever you do a multiplication on a list, what does it do? So f d is equals to d. Let's see what that does. Okay, we still have this exception here. I'm just going to hide it here and put a note that these provide index error. I'm accessing out of bounds. So on again, and let's see what d is. So here we have D is, we've repeated the value of 3 20 times. We can check of length, of length, then D. Of length 20. So it'll just be the multiple of that. What happens if you multiply two lists? I have no idea. Let's see what happens. E is equals to 3 times 4. Let's print E. See what happens. And we have a new exception. We have a type error. So you cannot multiply a, a list and a list. You can multiply a list and an integer. Um, what's interesting is that, so let's just write here. So this gives us some type error. And we're going to see how to handle that when we get to the section on exceptions. Now notice here we said it's the list that goes first and then we multiply it by 20. Can we reverse the, the positions? Let's try that with f. So if we have f is equals to 20 times 3. And we print f. These are fun things to try out. Well, it turns out that the order doesn't matter. You can put the 20 before, or you can put the 20 after. In other words, it's a commutative operation. So, commutative. Okay, so we've looked at <clears throat> so we've looked at um, index where we could find the index of an item. What happens if we try to get the index of something that's not in a list? Well, let's try that. We know our list has got the values 12, 13, 14, 15, 97, and 98. If we try and get printf 100, well, we don't even have to have an f string. Let's say f dot index the value 100. What does it tell us? Well, it tells us value error, and the value is not in the list. Okay. Another thing you can do on lists is you can count what's in the list. In our case, our list has one of everything. So let's make a new list, a new V. And I'm going to now have, we'll do that 3 times 10. And we're going to add another list to it. So we're going to put join two lists together, 5, 6, 7, 8. And we're going to print our new V. So when we do that, uh, so let's just mark here that this gives us an exception. This is a value error. So if we run that, so that's our list. We've got a bunch of threes, and then we've got five, six, seven, and we want to count how many threes there are, and we can print f there are v dot count three instances. Of three in, in V. And you can tell us how many are there are 10 instances of three in V. 
Now, one of the things you should keep in mind is all that we've done applies to strings as well. We can multiply strings by an integer to extend the string. Let's look at that just quickly. So print um, f times 3. You have f, f, f. It could be multiple of them. Ends up that way. And this is handy whenever you want to, like let's say you want to have a character that goes across the screen. You want a line. You can make a line easily using that operator. You can join strings. We saw how to do that. We can also count what we have in strings. We can count how many times a letter appears. There's an exercise on that. You can get the index of a letter and you can index within a string. So you can find if you have a string, like uh, the string S is, this is, this is a good sentence to work with. And I can get the index of a bunch of letters. So I print um, G. So let's say what is at uh, a certain index. So we could say S12, for example. And there we have the letter O. Now let's look at slices. This is a good way for us to transition into discussing slices. Slices are a way for you to pick or address multiple items at a time. And we're going to do this with lists. So we have our list there, V, which has got a bunch of threes, and five, six, seven, eight. So far we've been indexing only one item at a time, but there's nothing that stops us from picking multiple at a time. Still using the idea of starting from zero and ending at um, one less than the length. <coughs> So V, suppose I wanted from position 3 and colon up to position 7. Um, I can run that and I have those values because those are all um, the threes within the first 10 threes. I could also skip some numbers. So if I want to skip, I could say I could go two at a time. So the, the positions are... So there is a, the name of the list, the start, the stop, which is going to be excluded, and the step. So let's run this and see what we get. Well, we get three and three. Let's make a more interesting list so that we can actually see what's happening. So suppose, and for us to do that, let's use the, let's now introduce the range function. So the range function is used to create what's called a generator but we can convert that generator into a list. So if I, if I make r is equals to range 10 and I print r, it's going to tell me that r is a strange thing, it's a range object. It's a, a range, a generator is a strange thing, but we don't want a, range, a generator object, we want a list. So we'll just cast this to a list. And when we do that, now we have a list. So let's now use this list for slices. Let's make it a longer list. Let's make 20 items so that we can do a number of interesting things. So as before, we're going to print R3 to 10. 3, three just to go to 10. If you print that, we see 3, 4, 5, 6. Notice, um, because there are several things here, the range, in our case, we gave it a value of 20. It's going to get the values 0, up to 19. So it will stop at one value less than the value we give it. It will give us 20 items starting from zero. This is by default. Um, in the same way, when we use the index, the slices, since we start from three, we started counting at, we started counting from zero, then this is index zero, this is index one, two, three. So it started from three, and then we stop at number 10. So this is index 10, but we are going to exclude number 10. So whenever you say 10, it means we exclude number 10. So we start from 3, and we go all the way up to 9, and we exclude 10. Okay, You'll get, you'll get the hang of this the more you work with the list. But right now it sounds very strange, it's very weird rules. But, but they're very straightforward once you realize that 
what each of these values mean. So for example, here we have that it's, it's called stop. Stop means do not include this value end and forward. Let's do what we did here with, with, with a step. So we're going to say print r, 3, 10, and 2. So what do we expect will happen? Let's try and predict what's going to happen. We're going to have a, a step of 2. We're going to stop at 10. So what we expect to happen is we expect to get 3. Then we skip by 2. Instead of going to 4, we'll go to 5. Then we'll skip to 7. Then we'll skip to 9. And by, the, by then we're going to have reached, since 10, we stop at 10, we shouldn't expect anything else. Let's run that and see. And we get 3, 5, 7, and 9. So that is how we'd use it with, with a step. Let's, let's now add some new arguments to range. So let's create a new list, a new uh, uh, list that's called um, a W, is a list. And this time, we're going to use range, but we're now going to use a new start value. So we'll start at 15, and we'll go up to 20. So let's see what we get when we do this. So in the same way that we, we start from 15, by default here, what we didn't say is we're actually starting from 0. But now we're starting from 15, but we are going to stop at 20. So we'll have, we expect to get 15. 16, 17, 18, 19, and because we are stopping at 20, we're not giving the value 20. We're going to, yeah, we're going to stop at, at, at 20. So let's print that out. Print W, and W has got 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. In the same way, the range function has a stop value implied, sorry, a step value, which is implied to be one. So if we created a new list, um, x is equal to list, range, 15, 20, and steps of 2. What do we expect? Well, we expect that it's going to start at 15, and then we skip by 2 to 17, and then we skip by 2 to 19, and by then we've reached 20 where we stop, and that's all we should expect to see. So print x, and if you run that, we only get 15, 17, and 19. So I encourage you to play around with these. And it's good to get a very good handle on how to use them. Now, we have seen how to use negative indices. Well, when we started from the end. So let's do some fancy things now. So we're going to create a new list, um, K. And I'm running out of letters. And we're going to say list range 12. We go to 100. And we go in steps of Okay, let's actually do, since we're doing negative, okay, let's do 12, 100, and we go in steps of 3. So what do we expect? We expect to have 12, we skip 3 values, 12, we skip 13, 14, and then we get to 15, and so on and so forth. So let's print K. So there's K, 12, 15, 18, 21, 24. Now, we could do slices from the other side, from the back. So this is now we're getting a bit wild here. Yeah? So print k, and we are going to start from the back. So we're going to start from minus 1, and we're going to go to minus 10, and let's see what we get when we do that. Oh, we get nothing. I think that's because we have to start from minus 1 and go to 10. So the direction always has to be that way. So notice what we have here. We started from minus 10, and we go to minus 1. So let's, let's see what that is. So remember, this is 99 is minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, minus 5, minus 6, minus 7, minus 8, minus 9, minus 10. Start from minus 10, 72, and go all the way up to minus 1, and do not include minus 1. So we stop at 96 and exclude 99. We could also give it a step. Um, we could give it a step, a positive step, so we could print k minus 10, minus 1, and because we are moving in the direction, the positive direction, moving from beginning to end, we have to give it a positive step. So we say 2, what do we expect to see? Now we expect to see 72, 78, 84, 
1996. Let's run that 72, 78, 84, 1996. Because we have skipped, we have skipped uh, values. And to make matters just more complicated, we could reverse the direction that we are moving. So we could start from the end. So print K, start from the end, go to minus 10, and go in steps of minus 2. So let's think about what's happening here. It's not complicated as long as you keep the idea that we're going start, stop, step. So we're starting from minus 1, which is this guy here. We're going to include it because we have said start from that one. And we're going to minus 10, which was 72. And we are skipping minus 2. So we're going 99. Then we skip 2. We skip, we skip um, the second one because by default it would be 1. So we're going to go 99, 93, 87, 81, 75. And then we will go, we're going to exclude 72. So let's run that and see what happens. And that's what we get 99, 93, 80, uh, 87, yes, 87, 81, and 75. And there's an exercise which will show you how to work with that. So, whenever we use slices, so we've used a slice here with explicit values. But typically, you might want to assume certain values. So there are certain default values that you will have in a slice. So the default values, so let's do a, a typical example. We have K, we have printed K there. Let me just make this clear what K is here. K is equals to K. So that we can see what K is. And when we run it, we'll see what, so K is that long list there. K is that list that starts from 12, 103. But now if we say print, K, and we don't give it any arguments, but we tell it do the slicing. So for K, start from, by default it's zero. Stop at, by default, go all the way till the end. And step of, by default, one. Let's see what we get. Well, we get exactly the same list. We start from 12, just like we have here, and we end at 99, which is what we have there. So what we could do then is we could only specify values where we need them. So for example, we could say, if I only want the second value, but I want all values, then I could say K and, oops, sorry. So I'm gonna use the default values, default that, but I'm going to go two. So what do we expect? We expect to start at the beginning, go all the way till the end, but skip every other value. If we run that, that's what we get. We start at 12, we skip 15, we go to 18, 24, 30, and so forth. And the same thing could apply if we want to ex just want to specify where to end. In that case, you could even exclude the second column. So you could say, we want to stop at position 12, for example. You need to start at zero, go all the way up to the index 12, don't include index 12. So let's run that and see what we get. Well, let's look at the indices. This is 0, 1, sorry, let's use this one here. Um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So we don't expect to see 48, and that's correct. But we ex expect every other value up to there. So that's it about slicing. Slicing is a very important operation. Um, whenever you're dealing with not just lists, strings as well. You could do exactly the same thing with strings. So let's just do a recap of what we've looked at so far. We've looked at how to create a list. We've looked at how to do the addition operator. We've looked at the in, not in. We've looked at multiplication operator. We've looked at some of the methods. We've looked at count. We've looked at index. And we've then looked at the range function. We've done indexing and we've done slicing. So that takes us a good distance in covering the key ideas here. We've looked at the length, the mean, and the max. So now we're in a, what you need to now do is practice how to play around with these. Um, this has got all the examples. If you just go through this together with the video, then you're going to, you'll be able to make sense out of, of what's happening.
let me just put this. Uh, so I'm going to push this. Um, so the default for that. Um, one of the let's look at some of the methods now that are associated with with um, lists. So these are operations and functions. Some functions that work on lists. Again, we are using the documentation. We are not straying from the documentation. Now let's look at some of the methods associated. So the, we have we can do replacement where you assign a value to a certain position. And you can assign a value to multiple positions using the slice. You can delete values. So let's look at that. Um, let me add this here. So um, we can replace using the tool. So we have our list k, and we want to replace the value at position um, 12 with the number 1000. And then we now print our new k. New k is equals to and k. And now k at position 12 has been replaced with 1000. We can do this to multiple positions at once. So we can now use a slice. And we can say k at position 12, let's say 14. We had how many? We had 100 items. Did we have 100 items? We went in steps of this with about 30 items. So let's go from 14 to 20. Let's see, this might fail with an index error, but let's just try. And we want to put, let's see if we can put a string inside a, a list with numbers, s. And we print k, which will show us that lists can have so look at that 14 to 20 um, how many items do we have here let's say to 15 ah it's only oh, okay because we only have one one right okay then so that was just an experiment but let's do it with numbers so let's put different numbers here uh, 14 to 15 we put the number 77 for example and we do it up to 20. Well, I think we don't have a 20. It might be shorter. Let's see that. Ah, can only assign an iterable. That's a very good uh, error that's popped up. So we have so we have 14, 15, 16, 17, and we exclude 18, so there are four. If we are doing a, a, a slice, then we also have to provide multiple items. So we could do times four we know there'll be four there that's an excellent example that that illustrates um how this um, modification works so there we have multi mo mo um, modified more than one position at once what else did we have here so we had the now we have the delete so for the delete i'm going to move this up we can delete a value at a position so let's say we delete we just say delete k at 17 and now we print so before this we'll print the length of k of k and we'll print the length of k after and in fact what we could do is we could let's practice what we applied last week we'll say print the length has changed and we could do a, a logical here we could say, oh, that's interesting. We'd have to assign a variable. Ah, okay then. Uh, okay, then let's skip this. We'll just do that. But you could do this if you assigned a variable. So we have the length of k. We delete the value at position 17. And then we check the length of k again. We expect that the length will go down by 1. So let's run that. And that's correct. So now our list has got 29 items. And we can see what value is missing. Well, we are missing one of the 77s. We remove one of the 77s. We can now append items to a list. You're going to find that this is a very handy way to build a list, especially when you're using a loop. If you want to collect something as you go through the loop, use the append method. So let's create a new list, capital K, and we make it an empty list, and we can put something into the list. So k.append, 
you can put the number six, okay? And we print K. So now we have, K has, is a list with six. That's a very handy method you'll find over and over again. You can clear a list, you can make a copy. We have already looked at this. Uh, you can extend a list and you can update a list with a certain value by repeating it multiple times. And you can also, there are also these other methods. I'm not going to leave them for you to experiment with in the course of the quiz. So I think that's it for lists. Let's just see if we've covered everything. We've looked at append, we've looked at delete, we've looked at uh, indexes and slices, and we've looked at the range function. And yeah, we're going to play around with them. There's, there's a number of really good exercises that you can play around with to, to get your hands dirty. So I think that covers it for lists. And now for the remainder of the time, we're going to look at tuples. So let me just uh, commit this, and I push the list to be available. List not. Um, it's going to be available. Okay, so globally for excitepro.com. I set and commit, and it's pushing. Okay, so that's available now. That should be up to date on the Pro repository. Okay, it's taking its time. Come on. Okay, that's pushed and committed. So that's lists. What about tuples? So there are several ideas that we need to understand here. One is how to create a tuple. There are many ways of creating a tuple. And just as in the same way we had a list class to create lists, we have a tuple class to create tuples. So T is a tuple. T is a tuple. We can print what T is. And we can print the type of T. Oh, so we're still running our previous program. So let's, we're now going to run this one. So, right, we can run. so that's how a tuple looks like. And in this case, it's an empty tuple. Tuples have a length. We can check the length of the tuple, print the length of T, and it will tell us, unsurprisingly, that tuple is empty. Now, unlike with a list where we could create a list using just a pair of brackets, we can't do that with a pair of brackets. Let's see what happens when we use, to use a pair of brackets. If we have S, we print S and the type of S. We're going to find something very strange, which might show you why I'm using S. Oh, they changed it. So this changed in, okay, so you can do it now. Ah, so this was updated in, I think in the previous Python, you couldn't do this. Um, previously, you would, what you do is you, okay, I see, I think I know what, what, what that means. Okay, that, yeah, okay. So you actually can't, my, my, I'm, my, I'm not correct on that. You actually can't create a tuple. So this is good. So this is a second way, which I'm also learning anyway. You can create a tuple. The only thing you have to keep in mind is if you put a single object inside the tuple, so let's do this now with S, and let's make S tuple, and we put, let's say, a car, and we print S and the type of S. Now, everything changes. Now it's a string. Notice that we've used Unlike with a list where you could put an item, a single item, and create a list, you can't do that with, with, um, with tuples. In fact, the same applies even for numbers. If you put a number like zero, and you print i, type i, and you run that, it's actually an integer. So a pair of parentheses with an atom creates the atom. So how would we create a single item tuple. Well, that's now where it gets a bit weird. So what you do is you would say, let's just use T, and we would use, let's say, zero with a parenthesis only. So the parentheses will signal to it that, okay, this is special. We are going to have one item in this tuple. So if you print T, type T, and we run that, we see it's a tuple with one item. Another way of creating a tuple is where you use the comma operator without using the, the, brace, uh, the parentheses. So, for example, if I have uh, u is equals to 
five comma six and you print u type u you run that we see that it's a tuple so just using a comma is enough to make a tuple <clears throat> one of the things that is you 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 might find strange when it comes to working with tuples is unlike with lists they have a property called immutability let's create a tuple we're going to create a tuple um, t is equal to some tuple we're going to put five six seven eight nine ten we can address the in the same way that we did with the list we can say t of zero um, we can print t of zero t of zero is equals to we can And we run that, t of zero is five. Can we use slices? Let's try that, t of one, three, one, three. Yes, we can use slices. Can we modify a value at a position? Let's try that, print. Um, so let's just try directly t, and we try and modify the position at we want to modify the 8, so that's position 0, 1, 2, 3. So we say let's change the value at 3 to 12. Okay, let's try that and see what happens. We get a type error. Why do we get a type error? Because a tuple doesn't support item assignment. That's what immutability means. Immutability means you can't change it once it's created. Unlike with a list, in a list, you can change it, you can modify it, you can delete items. We can't do that here. So we know that this gives us a type error. What about deleting? Let's try that. Let's try and delete T3. Again, what do we get? Exactly the same thing. Tuple object doesn't support item deletion because it's immutable. Immutability means cannot be changed once be created. So this again gives us another type error. So how do you work with tuples? So if you want to, um, for example, is it possible to multiply a tuple? Would that involve, um, so let's do t is equals to, we have a tuple with one value, six, comma, remember, and we multiply this by 12. Will that work? Let's see, print t. Yes, it works. Why does it work? It works because we are not modifying the tuple, we are creating a new tuple. So that's how, if you want to modify, so I'm gonna put this in quotes actually here, we really don't modify tuples. We only ever make new tuples. So if I have a tuple, u is equals to one, three, one, two, and I have another tuple, v is equals to seven, 12, so I can print u and v, so if I print them, we see our two tuples, one and three, seven and 12. And I can say, what if I want to create W is equals to U. So can the plus operator work on them? V and I print W. Yes, it does. But W is a new tuple. We can check that again with the ID operator, uh, but we're going to skip that for now. We're not going to do that for now. But that's a really, really key idea. When you're working with tuples, remember that tuples are immutable. You can still perform operations on them. You can still check membership. You can check if a value is in. You can still do slices. You can still do indexing. But you can't modify a tuple once it's created because it's fixed. Anytime you perform operations on tuples, you're creating a brand new tuple. I think that covers it for tuples. Let's just look at the documentation and if you're... <clears throat> There's just one other thing that tuples support, which is there's a method they have called hash. But we don't really need to know that right now. Um, now, something else to keep in mind is strings behave like tuples in that you can't modify a value in, in a, in a position. So strings, in as much as strings, you can index and you can slice and so forth, strings are also immutable. 
So for example, if I have a string, uh, today is a good day, and I try to modify, um, if I say s at eight is a new character, like this shouldn't work. If it does, then that's going to be something new. The, if we run that, it says string doesn't support item assignment. So strings, like tuples, are immutable. Now, anytime you do an operation on a string, you're creating a new string. So that's what happens with immutable types. So let's just make sure we've gone through everything. So I'm done going through this. So let me just commit this. Uh, let me hide this so that we don't end up with that exception. So, uh, type error. Okay. And so this is tuple notes. Oh, there's one thing I haven't shown you how to do um, before I do this. And that's going to be, how do you convert a list to a tuple and a tuple to a list? So sometimes you want to make changes. Well, you could use, so this is what we call casting. I showed you this when we looked at the range. The range returned what's called a generator. We're not going to go into details of that. Um, but what what we could do is what we did is we cast the generator into a list and that worked well so the same thing we can do casting of of uh, containers so if i have a list l and i make a list from a range of let's say from 5 to 12 in steps of or let's say from 5 to 120 in steps of 4 for example okay and i can print that l so if i run that i have this nice long list and we know the type is a list. Okay, we cast it from the from that. Hmm. Oops. Sorry. I've just shown you some something that you <laughs> would not be useful for you. So that's a of type list. But we can now make a, a let's say T is tuple of L and print um, T type t and if you run that so we see we've now created look at it's changed from brackets to parentheses and it's now a tuple and you can do that back again so l2 is equals to list of t print l2 and again we've created a list and you can see that by the the bracket So this is casting of container, <clears throat> let's just tuple notes, and I'll push this. Okay. So that's it, we've looked at lists, we've looked at tuples, we've seen a number of methods on them. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at exceptions. The first exception that we looked at today was the index error. Now, there are many types of errors in Python. If you look at the documentation, you'll find quite a number of them. Um, and it's helpful just to have an idea. So let's, if you want to find the exceptions, you, you have to go to the home video documentation and you go to the language reference. This is not part of the library, it's part of the language reference. And there's a section here, 4.3 on exceptions. And it tells you, you know, different things about exceptions. But if you want to find out the different the, 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 the named exceptions that are available in Python, then that's what you'd find out from the library reference. In the library reference, there's a section on exceptions where it gives you a description of our exceptions, how to raise them. It gives you a bunch of base classes, which we are going to we skip for now. <coughs> but here are all the what are called concrete exceptions. Concrete exceptions are exceptions which create actual objects. What you have here with the base class, these are not, I don't think we use this. These are, I think they would be abstract, um, meaning that you, you can't create an object from them. You don't need to know that for now. What you need to know is just the names of the different exceptions. The naming tells you what's gone wrong. There are a quick way for you to figure out what's gone wrong. So there's assertion, attribute, end of file. You can read all this here. Um, there is key error, which we'll look at next week. Keyboard interrupt, that's a nice one which we can look at. 
Um, we, we saw this in the first class, and there are many, many others. But let's start, let's start off with the name error. We saw name error last week when we, when we did something like this, print s. And if you run that, it will tell us, oh, so we now need to be running the exception module. So let's run that. When you run that, it will say name error. So name error usually happens because you know, there's a variable that you've used that you haven't named, okay? So to get rid of that, usually you just provide the name, okay? So, so basically means, name error means the variable doesn't exist. Then there are value errors. Value errors happen whenever you perform an operation but using the wrong value. So let's look at an example. So if I say <clears throat> print 1 plus s, okay? And if you do, if you run that, also in this case it's a type error. Um, ah, okay. So the best example is if you try to do, um, if you try to convert an, a, a letter into into an integer. <clears throat> we saw this last week when we were trying to do the binary. If you try to make an integer out of a letter, it would say that's a wrong value. It doesn't know what to do with that. So value error means um, the value is incorrect. I don't need to write anything. That's what it basically means. Type error. We've just seen a type error. Type error occurs when, like for example, you use when it's an operation, so where you have the wrong type. So for example, if you try to to make, if you do a, a float, I think if you do a float of S, let's see what you get from that, that's still a value error. But if you do an operation between, so we wanted to do print that, that gave us a type error. It's because the concatenation cannot work between these different types. A syntax error means that there's something wrong with how your code is structured. So, for example, if I add a space and write print name, let's see, this should give us... Oh, it's in this case, it gives us an indentation error. But uh, let me try and think of a syntax error. Uh, syntax error would be... What if we said print? Well, that would probably not give us... Oh, it's still giving us... A, uh, Syntax error, or not indentation error. Um, oh, that's good. I'm still throwing that. Uh, name error print because the name is not available. I'm trying to think of an example of a syntax error. Well, what if. Ah. Ah, okay, then let's try this. What if you put that there? Uh, that's still an indentation error. I, I can't think of a syntax error. Syntax error is syntax when an import statement in an input sample exec reval when reading the initial script standard input. The string, uh, okay then. So this is going to be a bit, I don't want to show you the, I could show you the val function if the code itself is incorrect. I'm just trying to think of something which would, oh, okay. Um, what if I tried one plus plus two. Oh, that actually works. <laughs> okay, that's weird. I didn't expect that to work. Um, but if you come across a syntax error, let me know. But at the moment, I can't think of one off the top of my head. But a syntax error would mean, yeah, there's something wrong with the way your, your code is structured. We saw an index error earlier, and that's where we had a list. So we have L is a list range 10. And we try to get the item at L14, for example, and that will give us an index error. So an index error usually means that the index that you're using is out of bounds. So these are just examples. I have, I think I've mentioned in the in the notes, so looked at tuple objects and talked about immutability. With exceptions, I've said exceptions are, na are named and they are raised by Python. Um, I talked about tracebacks in the first week, but I'll, I'll go into detail about that again. Um, but for now, I have a bunch of exceptions here. So I've talked about name, syntax, value, index, and there's this full list that's available here. Some of them are quite exotic, stop a sync iteration, 
um, indentation. We have seen an indentation error. Tab error, this is when you mix tabs and spaces. System error, system exit. Type error, we've seen that. Unicode error and so forth. Unicode when you have values, values that are not encoded or decoded correctly or when it can't do the decoding. So there's usually either an encode error or a decode error and so forth. You don't need to know all of them. What you need to know, what's the most important thing to know is that exceptions are, they are named and they tell you something. And then the next important thing you need to know is how to handle them. So let's see how to handle them. We're going to look at two cases of this. So let's start, with, so let's just, so this is an example of an index error. When it comes to handling exceptions, we use what's called a try catch, try accept um, uh, block. And what you do is you say try. So let's repeat using this here. So L is that. We're going to try and print the value at L14. Now, whenever you start doing a, a, a whenever you do a try, it means you, you want it to catch a specific name. And you'd say, accept, so that's the keyword, accept index error. In other words, if you get, so let's get some value V is equals to the value at position 14. If you get an index error, then we're going to specify, you have to put a colon at the end. Then, do I have a type uh, tab? Then we will use a value of zero by default. So in other words, if you end up raising an, an index error, don't stop the program, but let's carry on and now let's use the value of V. So we're going to print the value of V. And when we run this, it will give us our value of V. So let's actually print out in the string V is equals to V. We run that, it says V is equals to zero. Notice it didn't raise anything, it was quiet, and that's because we caught the exception. Um, there are a number of things you can do here. You could give the exception a name. So you could say accept index error and you could give it a name using the as keyword, as IE, for example. And that means we can then print out. So let's say you could print out um, a warning and then you could print out IE. So in other words, you could capture what the exception is so that you could let the user know there was an exception. The exception was handled, but this is what this is the problem. So maybe you want to say um, length, list too short. And if you run this, it will say there's a warning. Oh, so this should be an F string. Sorry. If you run this, it will tell you a oh, warning, list index was out of range, the list is too short, but it used the default value that you provided. And that's a clean way to handle a, a, an exception. Another thing you could do is you could have multiple exceptions. So let's look at an example. Suppose you say, so you want to try uh, V is equals to, so So V is equal, ah, okay then. So V is equals to S plus L14. Well, let's just make it now a decent thing, okay. So L4, okay. Now, what do we expect will happen here? Well, L is a list of integers. These integers, when we try and add them, as we saw before, we got a different exception. I think it was a value error or a type error, one of the two, we'll see. We'll and then we say, accept index error. So we'll say, print a warning. And we're going to catch this as IE. Um, so we're going to say the, what the warning is. Index error warning, uh, list too short. And we'll set V is equals to, let's say, S0. Because let's say we want V to be a string. Uh, except um, type error as te print f warning 
t not the right type and again we'd say v is equals to s0 and accept value error as ve print f warning ve um, wrong wrong value and again we say v is equals to s0 and then we print f v is equals to v so if you run that what it tells us is warning can only concatenate string with that, not the right type. So that's what was actually raised. It raised a type error. We caught the type error and we handled that correctly. Um, so in this case, our list was of the right length. So that was not raised, but we caught the type error. So this is an example of catching multiple exceptions. So here we have caught an exception that was naturally occurred in the process of our code. What if we want to raise an exception? So sometimes you want to do that. So for example, if you ask someone, if you have a program where you ask them, let's say, we want to, we want to raise our own exception. Um, so you use the raise keyword. So we could do this even directly without, without even saying anything. And we could specify what exception we want. We could say type error, uh, something went wrong. If you run that, your program will raise a type error and the value, the string that we gave it will be the, the value that you get there, something went wrong. So there's an example where we have raised our own exception. And you can do that with any of them. You can run, you can raise this without passing anything. So you could just say raise type error with or without quotes. So just do that type error and it'll have a blank type error. You just say type error and there's nothing. Um, it wouldn't have anything else, okay? But it's good practice to be explicit. Remember from the Zen of Python, import this. Explicit is better than, than implicit. You want to be clear what's happening in your program. Now let's look at a special type of exception. And this is very useful whenever you want to foolproof your code. You'll have some examples of this in the quiz. For this, we're going to use a try with an accept, try accept block but we're going to do an assertion. So let's look at an example of this. We're gonna try, we're gonna get a value from the user. So age is equals to int age, sorry. We're gonna use the input function, um, your age. Um, ah, okay, so let's, let's actually push this out here. And we're going to try, um, ah, okay then. So let's do an assertion. So let's say, an, let's say we have to assert, assert, we're going to use a compound, ex, um, compound evaluation here, co comparison. So we don't expect someone to be more than 120 years. So it will be greater than zero and age will be, uh, let's say 120. Um, so accept, and there's a special exception that happens here. So let's say, actually, let's do this without the accept, and then we'll see what exception we get. So I'm going to try this. I'll hide this for now. I'll run the assert on its own, and we'll see what assertion come, what, what exception comes up. So the assert keyword is used to check that something is true. Whatever it has here must evaluate to true. So must ev for it not to raise an exception. If true, no exception. Otherwise, a special exception. Let's run that. So we ask your age, and I will give it a value which is not correct. Assertion error. That's a special one that we should use whenever we want to check that a value is correct. So now we know what the name of the exception is. We can then Cut, catch that exception. So accept assertion error, and then we can warn the user. Uh, print um, invalid say, error, invalid age, and we put the value that they put in age. So this is not correct. It should be assertion. 
So now let's run that and see. It's going to be much more graceful. It won't give us that ugly, those ugly red lines. And just as an error in validate. So you can use this now to make sure that your code, just to check that the arguments, and there's an exercise on this to help you figure that one out. So accept assertion error. Just keep those in mind whenever you use an assertion. And the key idea here is for an assertion, assertion checks if it is true. I think we've covered everything that we, we needed to. I haven't talked about the 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 trace back because we looked at that last week. But just to briefly capture what the trace back is about, so let's let's for example let's see this. We raise that here. A trace back is this ugly thing that Python prints, and what it's telling you is the sequence in which the program was run and how the different calls then resulted in the last position. So the, the last line here is where the actual error occurred. So in this case, what it did is it ran the module, so called exceptions of pi, line 49, which is this line here. So line 49 is this guy here, sys.exit main. It called the main function. And then it went into the main function and all, got all the way to line 38. So anytime you're trying to debug your code, just look for the last line and see the line number. In PyCharm, you can click on this and it'll immediately take you to that line and you can you can fix whatever is, is wrong on that line. Or you could debug it by printing out the various objects on that line and see which one has got a, a wrong value. Um, so I think that's it. Um, I think we've covered everything for this class. We've looked at the named exceptions. Uh, we've looked at practical examples. We've looked at how to raise an exception using the raise keyword. And we have looked at the assert keyword and um, how, we, how the assert keyword results in a special type of exception that's called the assertion error, which we can then exploit. We can catch that assertion ex exception just the same way using the as. You don't need to since you know what the assertion is. Um, but it allows your code to be very clean and graceful in how it handles errors so that your users will know when they have done something wrong. So that's it for, I think that's it for this class. I'm just going to recap what we've done today. So as a recap, we have looked at lists, tuples, and exceptions. For lists, we looked at how to create a list. There are several ways on how to create a list using the list class. Or we could use a bracket we also looked at the range function, which is used to generate values. We looked at how to do operations on lists. We looked at how to do addition. We could do multiplication. We, do, we looked at how to do indexing, whether it's indexing from the front, indexing from the back, using negative indices. Then we looked at slices and how slices allow us to pick a part of the list. Slices have three parts, a start, a stop, and a step. Always remember the stop is a value which indicates where you should stop picking items, which means that index at the stop will be excluded. There are default values for these, so you can just use, um, if you want a slice without any values, you could just slice, you put the bracket and two pairs of two, uh, two columns, which will have default values of zero, and it will go through the whole list, it will not stop at any position and it will go with a step of one. There's an interesting task which you're going to look at as part of your quiz, which I think you're going to enjoy. Um, tuples, we looked at how to create tuples. You could either use a tuple class or you could use the empty parentheses. However, with the empty parentheses, if you put a single item, you must end it with a comma. Then we looked at the idea of immutability and how for tuples, once you create a tuple, you can't change it. But whenever you perform operations on a tuple or on tuples, you create new tuples. And the same applies for strings. Strings are immutable. But the same ideas of indexing, slicing apply. So you cannot delete, you cannot modify a value at a, at a position. Then finally, we looked at exceptions. We looked at the named that exceptions, that this is a key idea, exceptions are named errors. And, and then we also looked at um, how to catch exceptions, how to catch multiple exceptions, 
how to catch the name of the exception using the as. We then looked at how to raise our own exceptions and also how to use a special keyword assert, which has a special error, assertion error, which can be used to make our code more foolproof. So that's it for this class. Um, there's only one thing that's left, and that's for me to ask you for review. As I said, as I've always been saying, I value your feedback, and I'd, like, I'd really like to know um, in what way you know, whether I'm, 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 if there's any value in how I'm presenting it. One of the feedbacks I keep getting re repeatedly is that the, the value on the, the, the screen size is too small. Now, to be honest, I have really expanded the resolution on my skin, and if I do it anymore, I wouldn't be able, it'll just be too big. Um, my suggestion is, if you're watching them on a phone, please try and watch on a, on a laptop. Um, that might help. Also, I'm not sure about the bandwidth that you're using. You need to watch them on 720p or higher. So that is HD um, in order for you to see the, the letters correctly. But if you can, please give me feedback. I can type this into the... So it's bit.ly slash 3IL1YEI. So just take a few minutes and please give me some feedback. But with that, we've come to the end of the class, and I thank you for participating. Uh, we'll see you in the next class where we'll be looking at dictionaries and sets. And that's going to be exciting because that's a powerful new container that allows you to do some very interesting things. So until then, goodbye.